Were you aware that in 1966, the Soviet Union's Luna 9 mission made history as the first spacecraft ever to reach the lunar surface and execute a soft landing? Prior to this achievement, our attempts had been limited to essentially hurling objects toward the moon, hoping they would successfully collide with it and perhaps relay some data before impact. Were you also aware that the Soviets were the pioneers of this primitive early accomplishment as well? In 1959, their Luna 2 spacecraft became the first human-made object ever to strike the moon or any celestial body beyond Earth. You're likely familiar with the fact that in August 2023, Russia made another attempt at a soft lunar landing with Luna 25, though that mission ended in failure as their spacecraft crashed uncontrollably into the surface, adding yet another crater and a fresh deposit of human debris for posterity. This represents quite a dramatic decline in moon landing capabilities over a time span when you'd anticipate technology would have advanced by multiple orders of magnitude. Perhaps Russia simply lacks competence. After all, they're not exactly beloved on the world stage at present. However, the Japanese company iSpace also tried to land on the moon in 2023 and met with failure as well. We understand that Japanese technology and manufacturing ranks among the finest in the contemporary world. A few years prior to that, India attempted a lunar landing with Chandrayaan-2 and also failed. We recognize that India is home to countless brilliant and highly educated engineers across the globe. Clearly, something more complex must be at play here, correct? What makes landing on the moon so extraordinarily difficult? Here's another fact you may not know. The moon possesses a remarkably irregular gravitational field. Earth, by contrast, has an extremely uniform gravitational force throughout. The pull toward Earth's core remains constant regardless of your position around its perimeter. Gravity begins to diminish at very high altitudes, but this occurs in an exceptionally smooth and foreseeable manner. The moon operates differently. Throughout the years, scientists have documented that the moon exhibits stronger gravitational forces in certain regions compared to others, essentially producing an irregular gravitational field around its perimeter. Specifically, these unexpectedly intense gravitational zones tend to appear above several impact basins, indicating that surplus mass from major asteroid collisions is concentrated beneath these basins and is distorting the moon's gravitational pull. In 2019, scientists verified the presence of an anomalous mass beneath the moon's south pole. While we haven't determined exactly what it is, this excess mass is calculated to equal approximately 2 quadrillion tons. Yes, I understand where your imagination just wandered. This could theoretically be some form of ancient extraterrestrial mothership concealed beneath the lunar surface. It's almost certainly not. But until we definitively identify what lies beneath, it could technically be virtually anything. More plausibly, this mass resides below the South Pole Aitken Basin, an enormous oval-shaped impact crater on the Moon's far side measuring 2,000 kilometers across and several kilometers in depth. It originated roughly 4 billion years ago when something extraordinarily massive struck the Moon. Simply by observing the Moon, we can readily see it has endured numerous substantial impacts throughout its existence, which have probably deposited numerous mass concentrations in completely arbitrary locations thereby generating an extremely irregular and unpredictable gravitational force that will consequently have an extremely random and unanticipated effect on any spacecraft that happens to pass over one of these zones during its descent to the lunar surface. This isn't the sole reason landing on the moon proves difficult, but it represents one of the more fascinating factors to examine the initial thing you'll discover. When you begin exploring the historical record is that most attempts to land anything on the moon have ended in failure. This isn't shocking regarding the earliest attempts during the late 1950s and early 1960s. Expectations were reasonably modest then. Yet even as NASA progressed into their surveyor program in 1966, which constituted a series of robotic lunar landings that established the foundation for Apollo, their success rate hardly inspired confidence. Among the seven surveyor missions, one lost control during its journey and tumbled into a crash landing on the moon. While a second mission lost radio communication with Earth two minutes before its landing attempt, consequently, we don't actually know what became of that one. Naturally, when we arrive at Apollo, there was never a failure during a crewed lunar landing, and this brings us to our first explanation for why so many moon landings fail. Human beings can address problems as they arise, whereas robots cannot, or at least could not at that time. The initial Apollo 11 moon landing would have failed without the exceptional piloting abilities of Neil Armstrong. From the instant their lunar module separated from the main spacecraft, 
The Eagle veered off course, and the computer guidance system proved unable to adjust for anything unexpected. It was simply executing predetermined calculations that would have guided the crew toward certain catastrophe. This is the moment when Neil Armstrong had to channel Luke Skywalker and abandon the targeting, computer in favor of his own judgment. He touched down on the moon under complete manual control with merely a few seconds of rocket fuel remaining. Obviously, not every moon landing can have a seasoned Navy pilot aboard to resolve problems in real time. These autonomous robotic missions therefore require that absolutely every element of the mission proceeds flawlessly according to plan. Otherwise, failure rapidly becomes the most probable result. The moon isn't particularly distant relative to the scale of the solar system, but it's sufficiently far that you cannot simply operate a moon lander remotely. The typical delay for round-trip communication amounts to approximately 2.5 seconds, and that's nowhere near adequate precision to accomplish a successful landing. All of this seems somewhat peculiar when we consider that NASA has maintained a fairly impressive record of landing on Mars over recent decades, and Mars is considerably more distant than the Moon. We can actually utilize Mars to help us understand why the Moon presents such challenges for a soft landing. Landing on Mars remains extremely difficult, but the process is facilitated by the presence of an atmosphere. Mars possesses a minimal atmosphere. It's substantially thinner than Earth's, but it's also considerably more substantial than what exists on the Moon. This means you can employ a parachute on Mars with some effectiveness. This is the critical distinction. A parachute alone cannot deliver a soft landing on Mars, but it can eliminate substantial velocity from the spacecraft and provide the lander sufficient time to execute a controlled and measured descent. Then for the terminal phase of landing, you can utilize something as straightforward as airbags to cushion the impact of a lighter payload. Larger NASA rovers have employed a combination of retro rockets and a sky crane to transport the payload safely to the surface. Since the moon lacks an atmosphere, none of those techniques are viable. The moon demands a completely propulsive landing, these are exceptionally challenging to execute. Even the SpaceX Falcon 9, which currently makes rocket-powered landings appear effortless, relies extensively on Earth's atmosphere to manage its descent through aerodynamic resistance and grid fins. These lunar landers must decelerate from orbital velocity to zero velocity relative to the Moon's surface, using nothing but an extraordinarily precisely timed sequence of rocket firings. That represents a substantial challenge regardless of who attempts it. Let's also recognize the increased difficulty presented by the locations on the moon that these contemporary missions are targeting for landing. In earlier times, moon landers would pursue the path of minimum resistance. The very first Luna 2 impact followed essentially a ballistic trajectory. The Soviets launched their probe directly toward the center of the moon's visible hemisphere, and that's essentially where it struck. The impact point was precisely centered on the east-west axis and approximately 30 degrees north of center. When the time came for more sophisticated landings like Apollo, we consistently targeted regions on the Moon's visible side near the equator. This approach allowed the spacecraft to travel along a relatively two-dimensional trajectory. Launching from Earth's equatorial zone and proceeding directly outward to the Moon's equatorial zone and returning again as horizontally as feasible, the Chinese became the first to break this pattern by accomplishing a soft landing on the Moon's far side with Chang'e 4 in 2019. However, the most recent wave of lunar expeditions, including the unsuccessful iSpace and Luna 25 landers, have been targeting the Moon's South Pole. This is an extremely significant region for the future of human exploration on the Moon because we believe the deep craters there contain vast reserves of water ice, which matters for more than simply giving us something to drink. Water consists of oxygen, which we can utilize for respiration. It's also composed of hydrogen, which we can employ as a fuel source. This means we must also determine how to place our spacecraft into a polar orbit around the moon. That necessitates a far more three-dimensional flight trajectory. This doesn't mean landing at the moon's south pole is impossible. The Indian Space Agency demonstrated this with the success of their Chandrayaan-3 mission. The reason India managed to achieve this accomplishment before anyone else was that they possessed the advantage of failing initially with Chandrayaan-2. Most people would concur that there's no superior method to Improve it virtually anything than by making an attempt, failing, and subsequently learning from your errors so you can perform better on the next attempt. Unless you're attempting something like free solo mountain climbing, in which case you won't survive to learn from your failures. But that's an entirely different matter. Regarding sending robots to the moon, 
As long as someone remains willing to fund the mission, you can continue launching them into space and learning through experience. As we mentioned previously, NASA failed at lunar landings extensively before they mastered success. Among the nine Project Ranger missions from 1961 to 1965 that attempted a soft lunar landing, only the final three succeeded, predominantly failures. Among the seven Surveyor missions, five successfully touched down on the moon, so predominantly successful. Then among the six Apollo missions that actually reached the moon without encountering a failure en route, all six were performed perfectly. The identical pattern is unfolding six decades later with the 21st century competition to reach the moon's south pole. Even with all the remarkable computer technology, transistors, and microchips available today, we still occasionally must fail spectacularly before we can succeed. We must learn to walk before we can run.